Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, welcome to this evening's SOAS Department of Development Studies and UCL Bloomsbury and East London Doctoral Training Partnership Seminar Series. Um, sorry for that mouthful. We're really, really delighted to welcome this evening Dale McKinley, who's a writer, researcher, lecturer, and political activist currently based in South Africa. He has a PhD in political economy and African studies from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, and he's the author of four books and numerous book chapters, research reports, journal and magazine and press articles on South African and international political, social and economic issues and struggles. His most recent book, which you can see outside and buy a copy of, uh, is South Africa's Corporized, Corporatized Liberation, a Critical Analysis of the ANC in Power. That was published this year and is a sequel to his first book on South Africa, The ANC and the Liberation Struggle, which was published in 1997. Uh, you can get it outside for £12, which is a discount from the, the regular price of £15.95. Um, we also have uh, Dr. Adam Hanier from the Development Studies Department here at SOAS acting as discussant this evening. Uh, his research includes the political economy of the Middle East, labor, migration, class and state formation in the Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, if you want to tweet this evening, the hashtags to use are SOAS Dev Studies and ESRC. Uh, and I'll hand over at this point to Dale if you want to kick us off. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Thanks, Joanne, and thanks very much for the opportunity uh, to speak. Um, I've been a bit of, on a bit of a tour on this book uh, in the United States and Canada, uh, and uh, tomorrow will be in Denmark uh, on this. So it's it's a bit of a, a little bit of a world a whirlwind tour, but it's been very very enjoyable, and I hope um, that our engagement this evening will be useful for you. Um, before I get into a little bit about the book itself. Uh, just uh, to situate myself in the context. I am not a full-time academic, although I've had a PhD for the last 27 years, um, and I am much more of a political activist. And my writing is informed by my activism. And uh, so when I have written about the ANC and the Communist Party and the trade unions and the liberation struggle and South African politics, generally speaking, it is as a, not simply as an observer, as an analyst, but as a participant. Um, I, just to give you, and so all the cards are on the table, uh, I was involved from the 1980s in the ANC in the underground struggle for many years, uh, and then in the Communist Party for 10 years before I was expelled from the Communist Party. Uh, and people ask me, why, can, how can you be expelled from a Communist Party? I say, for trying to be a communist, um, <laughs> at least in the South African context. Uh, that was 18 years ago. Um, and have been the co-founder of two of the larger social movements in South Africa, the Anti-Privatization Forum, which was a, a collection of about 40 different community organizations, and more recently the Right to Know campaign, which is an access to information and freedom of expression movement in South Africa. Um, I come unapologetically from the, obviously from the left side of the political spectrum, um, but uh, the arguments that I'm going making in this book and what I'm going to talk about tonight, I think uh, are quite self-evident in many cases for those that are paying attention to what's going on in South Africa and have been looking at the, the, the past 23 years since the ANC took power. Um, so I've lived this book. It's not just a matter of, of uh, just writing it. What are the key arguments in this book? What is the foundational arguments here? Basically, I situate this within a historical context, which I made these arguments quite a long time ago in the first book on the ANC, which is that... Uh, <sighs> People have become quite disillusioned and disappointed in what's happened in South Africa. Let's be real and honest about that. There were many, many expectations uh, that the ANC, when Nelson Mandela became the president of South Africa, was going to be a different kind of country, a different kind of place, uh, a very progressive and possibly more radical experiment in uh, building a new kind of society. Um, and unfortunately, that has not really come to pass, although there obviously have been a lot of, of positive and good things that have happened over the last 23 years. But fundamentally, uh, the explanatory factor that I use here is basically looking at the leadership core of the ANC and essentially saying that from the beginning and all the way through its, its uh, struggle, the ANC and the leadership, and that included Mandela all the way back, was one of class aspiration. In other words, that fundamentally there was never any real intent, nor political or organizational intent, to create a revolutionary situation in South Africa that would overthrow the existing economic situation 
and social order. What it would do would be to overthrow the political order. In other words, to put it very mildly, I mean to put it very bluntly, a deracialized capitalism. And there is a great quote that I use uh, from one of the former general secretaries of the ANC that says it much better than I can. And this is from 1949. It was Dr. A.B. Kluma, and he was being asked, what does the ANC think of capitalism um, in, in the context of a young Nelson Mandela and Oliver Tambo in the 1940s who were coming up? And his reply was this. He said that it is of less importance to us whether capitalism is smashed or not. It is of greater importance to us that while capitalism exists, we must fight and struggle to get our full share and benefit from the system. 1949. Um, now, that does not mean that there were those that were in the liberation movement, such as some communists and, and radical trade unionists that had different ideas about a socialist society or much more radical uh, alternatives. But fundamentally what drove the ANC, I argue, is a politics of accession and incorporation. What do I mean by that? I mean a politics that fundamentally looks to institutional and systemic power uh, as, as the goal. So therefore, essentially, the state is the ultimate throne of that power. You capture the state and then you use the state in order to be able to transform society. The problem with that, that, that scenario is, is that if you simply capture a state and you don't transform that state in any meaningful way, well then you begin to reproduce the very same oppressions, the very same practices as those that you overthrew. And I would argue that this has applicability to all sorts of liberation movements, not just the ANC, but Trilimo, the MPLA, ZANU, where I come from and was born in Zimbabwe, um, and one can see this in many cases. The other aspect of this, which has a more theoretical component to it, it was argue, is that if you look at Marx's class, classic dialectic of the objective and the subjective, if you are a, someone who wants to change something, then you are obviously engaging your agency, your subjective understanding, you see something is wrong. The apartheid system is morally indefensible. We want to change it, we want to overthrow it. Fair enough. You're then faced with the objective realities of that, the apartheid state, the military, uh, all, all sorts of powerful economic institutions, white monopoly capital, so forth and so on. And it's the interplay of that dialectic, obviously, that, that um, takes things forward in terms of a revolutionary struggle. My argument is that fundamentally the ANC privileged the objective side of that equation and essentially took the subjective for granted. What do I mean by that? I mean, essentially, what it did is it used the mass. It used the people to get to where it wanted to, which was to access institutional power. Once it had access institutional power, the people get left behind. The people no longer have their use. They have their use to get there, but after that, and therefore, what did they then say when you, you access power, is what the ANC says to the people is, we no, no, we no longer need to struggle. We no longer need to change something. We have liberated you. Just like Robert Mugabe says in Zimbabwe, ZANU PF, the party liberates you. Therefore, the party and the state become the same thing. The liberation movement becomes the ANC, and the people become peripheral to that poss the, the, the possibilities of change. Also, of course, when the people then begin to say, well, hang on a second, what about the things that you promised us? What about the Freedom Charter? What about the people shall govern? The people shall own the, the resources, and so forth and so on. The standard answer to that is it's not possible. Why is it not possible? Because of the balance of forces. What are the balance of forces? The objective material conditions do not allow us to do those kinds of things. So what was the standard response to what happened in the negotiations in South Africa in 1993, 94? The standard response was, comrades, we can't do that. We can't take on capital. We can't do these things because if we do, we're going to get isolated. We're going to get smashed by international capital. Essentially, just bring it down. What does that mean? We don't trust you. We don't, we, not, we don't believe in the power of people to actually change something. We're privileging the objective reality and we're basically orienting towards institutional power. We're, giving, we're privileging the power of capital, the power of those that have. That basis, I would argue, has explains a lot. The foundational basis explains a lot of what's happened over the last 23 years or so. And in order to explain that, I use the house metaphor to try to make it very, very simple. What do I mean by the house metaphor? Picture South Africa as a house. In the 20th century, the house was controlled by political landlords and economic landlords. The political landlords were the Nationalist Party, the apartheid state, uh, the, 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 the um, P.W. Bota and company uh, back in those days. 
The economic landlords was predominantly white monopoly capital, five or six large corporations that dominated, you know, from the 1970s and 80s, five corporations hold 80% of the value of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, very highly monopolized, racialized capital. What happens? A struggle takes place. Negotiations happen. What's the deal? The deal is that one set of political landlords marches outside the house and a new set of political landlords march into the house. The National Party marches out, the ANC marches in. The economic landlords remain. The economic landlords do not change. They sit there in the same house. What then happens? Well, of course, there's some changes. The house gets a new coat of paint. New buildings, or new, new rooms are put onto the house. There's new available rights. So there are some there are some good things that begin to happen, but fundamentally, over, after uh, some time goes by, what begins to happen, the political and economic landlords begin to become really chummy and buddies again because they're ruling the house, and they begin to up the rent. They begin to put spy cameras in the hallways and, and put bigger walls around the property. They begin to hold all-night parties. They begin to raid the pantry. You can play this metaphor out in terms of the last 23 years. But most fundamentally, over the last 23 years, what's happened, nobody is paying attention and nothing was mentioned in the negotiations about the foundations of the house. Nobody talks about the foundations of the house. It was simply about capturing the house, about entering into the house. Freedom is one. We have entered the house, we govern, we have the state. The foundations are rotten. The foundations of that house are rotten. And over the last 23 years, the house is listing. It's beginning to list. It's beginning to... And nobody has moved down into those foundations other than legislatively. So yes, there were new laws passed. Yes, there were a range of different positive things that were happening. But socially and economically, not much was changed. Therefore, what then is almost inevitable as a result of that is that things are reproduced. The inequalities are reproduced. The very same oppressions begin to be reproduced, except this time they are deracialized. In other words, they're not on the basis of racial segregation, racial identity, you cannot pat, but mostly on the basis of class, with racial overtones simply because the inherited racial inequalities are reinforced. So they follow those kinds of simple, uh, similar racial patterns. That's the fundamental uh, metaphor that I use in this, the book. Now, if you look at that metaphor, transposing it onto a critical look into the realities of the last 20 or so years in South Africa, what this, journey, what this confirms is one thing beyond doubt is that liberation, the liberation that has been achieved, has been, shall we say, truncated. I call it a corporatized liberation. I'll explain why I use that term in particular. But a very truncated liberation. And why is that the case? It's simply because there can be no meaningful liberation in South Africa or anywhere else for the majority without a simultaneous assault on and struggle against the architecture that constitutes the foundational root of South Africa's problems. What is that root? Plain and simple, it is a capitalist system. One can never understand the apartheid system without understanding the development of capitalism in modern day South Africa and 20th and 19th century South Africa. You cannot separate the two. You can't understand those two things. So, simply in rational terms, you cannot have a liberation that separates the two either. You can't have a liberation that sort of says, no, oh, wait, hang on a second. We've liberated you. We've gotten rid of the apartheid system. Capitalism has always been there. It doesn't matter. It's okay. That thing is going to exist. What we're going to do is we're going to try to basically, like everybody else in the capitalist world, we're going to try to be basically uh, uh, palliative. We're going to put band-aids on the, on the system. We're going to try to have a little bit of redistribution here and there. And as we'll see, this is exactly what has happened in the last 23 years. So the, the plain and simple is the capitalist system overlaid by historical, historical racialized construction and division of the apartheid system itself, whose core being and practical purposes are the pursuit of, and this is a universal critique, doesn't specific to South Africa, a troika, a three-sided pursuit of profit, accumulation, and enabling power. In other words, through the state in this particular case. The human and natural costs are only relevant to the extent that they threaten that troika. So it's amazing that we can have a situation where the very same people who sacrificed a great deal and who spoke in the name of the people and had this incredible moral authority, today turn around and tell poor people, the 40%, 45% of South Africans who cannot even get a job, structurally unemployed, which would create a revolution in most countries, uh, if that was the case, you had 40, almost half your population that had no job, and tell them, sorry, there's nothing we can do about that. It's simply the structural realities of the economic system, 
We live in a capitalist world. It's tough. We're trying our best. If there's no, if there's, that, if there's no better confirmation than essentially the betrayal of the agency, the promise of the, the possibilities that were offered in the liberation system, which we used. So liberation, influenced or driven by whatever historically informed demographic or culturally specific factors, in other words, whether it's in Zimbabwe or otherwise, turns out to be little more than a political and racially framed shifting of the capitalist balcony chairs without a corresponding transformation of the socioeconomic foundations. This is surely the most fundamental lesson of post-apartheid South Africa. It logically follows, then, that whatever else has transpired in a liberated post-apartheid South Africa, the way in which the ANC is approached, institutionalized, and exercised that power, in a, in a phrase, its post-1994 strategy and tactics, is at the heart of understanding what has happened in South Africa over the last 23 years. As is the case historically, this ultimately subjective or human realm cannot be fully grasped without linking to the complementary objective conditions within which those strategy and tactics have been pursued. And this is what I do in the book. So let me just go through some of the key arguments in the book, um, as a, because we don't have time here but uh, to, to go into in, in depth into each of these. But what I do in the book is each chapter is framed around that house metaphor. So the first chapter is getting into the house what happened during the negotiations, what was, what was uh, uh, negotiated away, what was not, what was the deal. Then guarding the house, in other words, dividing and ruling the house, managing the house, democracy, internal dissent, how people respond to critique. And South Africa, as everybody knows, is considered to be the protest capital of the world, um, where people are constantly engaging in class struggle and other kinds of racialized struggle. Uh, inequality, corruption, uh, popular power, so forth. What kind of house is the ANC built? And then how can we move beyond that? That's how we deal, that's how I deal with it in the book. Let me just take some of the key arguments that come out of this book based upon that framing, foundational frame that I just outlaid, okay? Which is this. There are several of them. Despite the adoption of a socially progressive constitution, something that liberal scholars love to celebrate in South Africa. Oh, we've got the best constitution in the world. You know, South Africa is it's the only country in the world where you cannot discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. So I guess it's good. It's great. It's excellent that we've got that. But the reality on the ground is something very different. I was a board member of the Lesbian and Gay Equality Project for 10 years, which is, was the, one of the key organizations uh, fighting for lesbian and gay rights in South Africa. And I can tell you that for black lesbians in the township, that constitution means very little. Very little in terms of their experiences at the hands of misogynist, uh, homophobes, uh, corrective rape, uh, that was, a, was, was a, a, a crisis many years ago and still remains so, but it's very underreported, everything else. So yes, despite the adoption of progressive social constitution, which guarantees all sorts of socioeconomic rights, water, electricity, housing, so forth and so on, these are positive things, and they should be celebrated to a certain extent. But, and an institutional le legislative framework, for democratic governance. So there have been a lot of advances. We've got a very good labor laws in South Africa. Uh, we've got a whole range of good uh, access to information laws, for example. We're the only country in the world, or one of the only countries in the world, where you can guarantee by law that you can access, you have the right to access information from both public and private sector. So uh, according to the law, you can approach a corporation and ask for information, um, and you're supposed to get it. Unfortunately, once again, the reality is something very different because when you base transformation on a legal system that is inherited and untransformed, that legal system then wraps you up in a process of lawsuits and court processes that poor people cannot engage. So the vast majority of people then have to basically, there's also a question of just getting lawyers, and, and you ask a corporation, for example, whether they've been poisoning the groundwater or mine in a community, and you want to know exactly what their environmental impact assessment said. They say, no, that's confidential information. The law basically says, well, you go to court to get it. Well, the poor community can't go to court because they can't afford, and there's very few lawyers that will do pro bono. That's just one example. Despite all of these things, there's simply no denying that under the ANC's rule, power has not only remained in the hands of a small minority, but has increasingly been exercised in service to capital. Just different kinds of capital, different fractions of capital, different racialized components of capital. Some old white, some new black, some Chinese capital, some transnational capital, whatever. But it's capital nonetheless. 
and it's served in service to that. So when you hear debates about decolonization in South Africa and white monopoly capital, what you don't hear from those same people is where the black capitalists who've gotten in bed with those white capitalists, you don't, so essentially they're saying, well, no, it's the, it's the, it's the white capital that we have to blame when we have to get, but you don't, you don't ask the question about Patrice Motsepe, who, for example, is the richest billionaire in South Africa, who made his billions through the ANC. Cyril Ramaphosa, who might become the next president of the country, who spent 18 million rand on buying a buffalo stuff <coughs> for his buffalo farm. Um, he might become the next president of the country. How did he make his money? Through white capital itself. He might become the next president of the U.S. Because, so you cannot understand one without understanding the other is the point here. Both in party, the ANC has become the key political vehicle both in party and state form, of corporate capital. Again, both domestic and international, both black and white, both local and national, and constitutive of a range of different fractions of capital. That's one of the key arguments that I make in this and show how that has happened. Second point, over the last 20 or so years, it has been the fight on and over this terrain, with some against, some in the middle, some four, this principally defined the journey of the ANC and the state since 1994. Central elements of this have taken place within the ANC. As anybody who's paying attention to contemporary South Africa can note, I was just talking earlier on, that over the last 18 months, 45 local councillors have been assassinated. ANC councillors have been assassinated by ANC people. ANC is killing itself. It's fighting over positions of power. They're it's, it's eating itself alive. These are the natural outcomes of this kind of politics. One faction is going after the other faction. Zuma, our president, is at the heart of that battle, as are many others. The central elements of this have taken place within the ANC, the alliance itself. I talk about the Communist Party, the role of the Communist Party, the role of the uh, Congress of South African Trade Unions, which we don't have time to go into, but suffice to say that they have played factional roles themselves that have covered uh, one of the reasons why I was expelled from the SACP is I basically said to their leadership, you're a bunch of hypocrites. You sit on platforms, you talk about the working class, and you make radical rhetoric, and then you occupy ministerial positions and you privatize basic services. Well, of course, that's, that's not, there's nothing communist or socialist about that, but in South Africa we live in total contradiction to these things. And of course, when you raise these things, and us also even as a white person, well then you're shut up because your voice does not matter because you don't speak on behalf of the majority. And that is another prob problem is that, as we've seen in Zimbabwe, is that you shut down debate and dissent based upon, this is the ultimate irony, is that the ANC's anti-apartheid struggle was supposed to be a non-racial struggle. It was supposed to be one that, that combined, that allowed Indians, coloreds, whites, blacks to come together in a national liberation struggle and to stop defining people according to purely their race under the old apartheid categories. And yet, when you go into South Africa and any identification system, the very first thing that asks you is, are you Indian? Are you colored? Are you white? Are you this? Exactly the same apartheid racial categories. Exactly the same definitions. The ANC in KwaZulu-Natal, Zuma's home province, just, the other, just a few weeks ago, issued a proclamation blaming Indians for the problems in KwaZulu-Natal that the Indians were the problems, re-racializing the entire uh, sort of, excuse me, political scene um, in that, in that uh, province. So we see this again and again playing itself out. Third point, like the journey of capital itself over the last few centuries, this fight between the factions and uh, representing capital, representing in the ANC itself, has produced different fractions, or more accurately in political terms, factions, as I've said, within the ANC. Examples would be a potentially modernizing capitalist faction. So Ron Poser represents this, which is sort of like, look, we want to embrace uh, a social democratic uh, capital. We want a more caring, humane face of capitalism. We want a redistributive component. We want clean governance. We're not corrupt, so forth and so on. But we don't want to fundamentally change anything in terms of the economic and social side of things, excuse me, a, a, a technocratic faction, in other words, similar, that looks simply at the finances, that we will do a better job, and what I call the gangsta fashion or traditional nationalist faction, which is essentially about looting the state, which is unfortunately seems to be the preoccupation of our president at, the, at, this, at this particular stage in his faction, um, 
and who basically wants to use the state uh, to uh, accumulate their own wealth and that of their faction. Fourthly, at the heart of the ANC strategy and tactics is the underestimation, and this is crucial, of the revolutionary potential and liberatory ethos of popular democratic power, which was what drove the anti-apartheid movement in the first place. Let us be under no illusions about who freed South Africa. The people freed South Africa. The ANC did not free South Africa. Nelson Mandela did not free South Africa, even himself, as he was a fairly humble man, and he pointed out himself, don't say, you know, make me a saint. Don't make me, it's, it's the people that did these things. As I was pointing out in, in, a, in a conversation early on, and I do in the book, at the same time that the ANC, in 1985, was issuing the call to the civic groups, the women's groups, the youth groups in South, South Africa to make the country ungovernable, to go out on the streets and fight the apartheid state, which they did, Thabo Mbeki and his technocratic faction within the ANC were meeting with the IMF and the World Bank, cutting deals already in 1984-85 of a post-apartheid situation, which was, what? Don't touch the economy. Don't touch capitalism. We understand. So capital itself, Gavin O'Reilly, the CEO of Anglo-American, one of the oldest uh, uh, capital, uh, capitalist formations in South Africa, went and met with the ANC in 1985-86, and when he came back, he was asked, well, what do you think about the ANC? He goes, I think they're eminently reasonable men, and they understand that they do not want to throw the baby of capitalism out with the bathwater of apartheid. And this was 1986. He understood very quickly that the deal that was going to be cut was going to be one which kept that economy intact and basically allowed for a political uh, change to happen. So how does that... How is that allowed? It's not just an inevitability, which oftentimes a lot of analysts argue, and I take this argument on. Many people that have written about South Africa in the last 20 years want to make an argument is the balance of forces. It was never possible. How could you actually even have a revolutionary potential? If you did, there was going to be a civil war in South Africa, the right wing. This was played out, and I can tell you from being involved myself in the early 1990s in self-defense units, which were the ANC units, ANC aligned units in the townships, which were fighting many of the covert uh, apartheid hit squads and others, and then Kata aligned, which was another party uh, that you know. There was no such thing, by the way, as a peaceful transition in South Africa. From 1990 to 1993, 30,000 people died. 30,000. That's more than many wars, uh, small wars, about 20 times more than have ever died in Northern Ireland over a 40-year period. And this was in three years. There's no such thing as a peaceful transition. It was an underground war going on. And in the, in the context of that, um, there was a great deal of silence from the ANC. And people were asking and saying, we can, we can move things, we can struggle, we can have a more radical outcome. And the ANC's answer was, no, we can't, because if you do, the right man is going to create a coup here. And the military will come back and we'll have a civil war. This was the answer that was given to everyone. When Chris Hani was assassinated, Mandela got on national television and appealed to everybody for calm and said, don't, please, youth, go back to your homes. Don't come out into the streets. Please don't fight. Do this. We will take care of it. We will deliver your freedom. A few weeks later, a deal was cut with F.W. de Klerk. Nobody knew what was taking place behind closed doors. Nobody knew what the terms of that agreement was. The youth and everyone were left out of the equation because the, the, the thing was, don't, the people, you'll cause too much trouble. You're gonna, it's out of our control. The revolution is too messy, and the right wing will come and will defeat us, and then we'll be back to a war. Well, the point about any revolutionary struggle is if you tell the people what they can and cannot do, and you speak on their behalf all the time, then you're never going to know what the potential outcomes of any revolutionary struggle are. You're always going to have a managed process, one that is an elite-led process, and this is what I would argue has definitely happened. And that makes the liberatory potential uh, ethos of popular democratic power and how that can be harnessed and exercised to lay down an institutional policy foundation for systemic change. It was never really given an opportunity. Never. You cannot potentially even win a battle or at least win aspects of battle if you don't engage it. As James Baldwin, the famous uh, African-American poet, once wrote, not everything can be faced, uh, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed 
unless it is faced. So you've got to, you, that's, that's the thing, you've got to allow for these things to, to begin and people themselves to take it in a way as opposed to determining what is and is not possible prior to the possibilities of that struggle. The ANC and the state, as a result, the ANC and the state that is politically controlled for the last 23 years have become corporatized in both form and content as a result. What do I mean by corporatized? I mean essentially that the state and the party have taken on the corporate form. What is the fundamental purpose of a corporation? Power and money. Institutional power and money, capital, accumulation of those two things. And as a result, things become com society, your politics becomes commodified. So what do we see in South Africa? This is amazing parallels, and many people don't know these things. The very first PR agency that the ANC engaged for the 1994 elections, does anybody know who, who they engaged? Stanley Greenberg, does that name ring a bell? Stanley Greenberg was Bill Clinton's PR firm in the United States. And they engaged him, and basically, of course, what the deal was, is you're going to have a media-driven, leadership-driven, leave the people out of the equation, that's what you're going to have. And you're going to sell this, and you're going to, basically, your politics becomes one of appearance. Of, and you commodify that. It's about how much money. You go after corporations, you get donations. The ANC, to this day, refuses to tell South Africans where it gets its money from. Well, I tell you in the book where it's got some of its money from. Let me give you two examples. And this will, it's amazing, it just really, sometimes you want to just go, wow, is this really true? This is at the same time, so Mandela himself was giving a speech in the late 1990s when he was president. And it was, it was in honor of the king of Saudi Arabia, the Saud family, those renowned Democrats, <laughs> um, who just love, you know, the people, and especially women and their rights. And the Saudis had given the ANC 10 million U.S. dollars, which at the time was a fortune, to run its electoral campaign. You know who else gave the ANC money? Suharto from Indonesia, that, another renowned Democrat who massacred communists. Babaginda, Ibrahim Babaginda, dictator in Nigeria, giving the ANC massive amounts of money. King Hassan of Morocco, another renowned Democrat and human rights defender. The list goes on. These are the people, and I won't even get into the Israeli connection, um, while the ANC was talking about the Palestinian struggle, while at the same time it was dealing underhandedly with Israelis um, on the nuclear front, and, and rich plutonium and so forth, which is a continuation of the apartheid relationship. Uh, these are examples of how, in this context, the ANC has in, in many ways become corporatized because to be corporatized in that sense you really don't really care so much about the people only when it's election time that's when you care about the people so of course you go out into the neighborhoods you do everything you start spending money you build new roads and infrastructure you do these kinds of things as soon as elections are over and you're re-elected well then you forget about it and the people then go back into the background what does that then do over a period of time? Well, of course, it shifts the balance of forces even further away from the mass, from the workers and the poor, which are the majority. Therefore, it's a, it becomes a fait accompli. Your analysis becomes a fait accompli, which is, well, comrades, we can't do that because the balance of forces are against us. Well, of course they are, because you've helped shift them even further to that side. You've actually taken the power away from the possibilities of that change, and therefore the argument becomes less and less realistic that you can actually change anything. So the alternative, there is no alternative. We cannot do these things. All of this gets pumped time and time and time again, which is fundamentally, as I write here, that's the neoliberal, what I call the neoliberal trick. What is the neoliberal trick? To convince all of us that there cannot be an ideational alternative. There is no, it's Francis Fukuyama, the end of history. There is no struggle anymore. It's all the struggle is, is to make capitalism better and to find little niches within the system. That's it. That's what we can do. That's what lefties and progressives and other people can do. This is only 23 years after a struggle in South Africa. It's instructive. The other instructive point is electoral politics itself. If electoral politics is the be-all and end-all of democratic representation, which we're told by liberals that it is, the democratic you know, politics, well then let's look at the, democratic, uh, the electoral terrain. 
23 years after the people got the right to vote for the first time in their lives. The majority, otherwise, in other words, outside of white population, the black population got to vote for the first time. Do you know what the turnout in the elections were, the last national elections were? 52%. The turnout in the last local government elections were below 50%. That means over half the eligible population doesn't even think that electoral politics makes any difference anymore, for whatever reasons they might have. And it's not apathy, by the way. It's a convenient explanation. People are apathetic. No, they're not. Not voting is just as much a political act as voting is, in many cases. People do not, do not see what, the, what the possibilities of the ANC or any other, and they won't want to vote for the right-wing parties or any others. And um, so in the electoral context, it doesn't tell a very pretty picture either uh, on that case in terms of the balance of forces moving away. And what does that do? The ANC then claims, and this is repeated by academics and analysts and newspapers, the ANC received an overwhelming majority in the last elections. The ANC is the most popular party. Well, yes, of what? Break it down, which I did in, in doing this book. So what do we see? What are we told? The, well, the picture that we're told is the ANC got 64% of the vote. And that looked a pretty good, nice majority, right? 64% of what? 64% of what? Well, 64% of, of those who actually voted. Break it down. Let me just give you the real quick picture. 30, there's about 37 million people eligible voters in South Africa. In other words, over 18 people are eligible to vote. There are 30, around 33 to 34 million of those are registered. Right? So there's, the, there's your electorate. Out of that, of those registered voters in the last national elections, about 18 million voted. The ANC got 64% of 18 million, which is what? Around 12 to 13 million of, an electoral, of a, a registered population of 33 million. That's less than a third. That's less than a third. Now you say, well, that's just electoral politics. But if we accept that, that that's just what we have to deal with, we've got to accept it, then what we basically are saying is, well, there was no need for this struggle in the first place. What was the whole purpose of trying to revolutionize the system? It was just a pipe dream anyway. So we just have to deal with this, and you just have to vote in every five years person, and then they forget about you, and that's the nature of our representative system. The whole point of the South African possibility is we wanted something different, something else. Participatory, properly driven democracy, not representational, sterile democracy which then allows people and, and the representatives pretty much to do whatever they want. Several last, uh, and you'll give me an indication of when I've got a couple, of five minutes left, yeah. Um, so, extended to a societal-wide level, and under the overall theoretical and conceptual framework of the ANC's National Democratic Revolution, which I deal with here, which we don't have necessarily time to go into, but I'm sure some of you are familiar with this basic theory that came out of the Communist Party, the two-stage theory of revolution, which was you concentrate on the national democratic stage first, in other words, one person, one vote, overthrowing the party system. Once you access power, then you can at some point proceed to a second stage, which is the socialist stage. It's a theoretical absurdity and an intellectual absurdity because what it assumes is that in doing this, in getting to into power and accessing, you still remain the same. That when you walk into that house and you start co-governing that house with economic landlords, you don't pay any attention to their practices. You don't not affect it by any of the system. You still have your same principles. And 20 years down the road, you pop them out of the bag and you say, socialism's here. And we're going to implement it now. Nothing could be further from the truth. Just think of your own personal experiences. You can start going and living in Chelsea. Or in the, the, and you go and live there for 10 years. And you go to private school, to the, to the Larney schools and to the, to the real, and you hang out with those people. Eventually, you're going to start being just like those people. You're going to start doing exactly the same thing, thinking, doing that. It's called socialization. Unless you're an, a really, really dedicated Trotskyist. Um, <laughs> and, you can, and, and an entryist in which you, you know, in, in that, and, and with all due respect, I, I have many, many comrades uh, who are in the Trotskyist movement. Um, and, but... The point is, is that it's a theoretical absurdity in the context that you can't just spring this somehow down and you're unaffected by this possibility. And of course, in reality, this is exactly what's happened, is that those who entered this and who made these deals have themselves changed. They've become the new bourgeoisie. They've become the new capitalist class. They've become, they, they have, they're saying exactly the same things. They're doing exactly the same. Why is it? How can we explain? 
that the ANC refuses to change certain pieces of apartheid legislation. To give you one example, amongst many, you think, you know, not only security legislation, by the way, and intelligence legislation, which is exactly the same as it was in many cases 30 years ago. And so someone like myself, others, the snooping, the spying, the, 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 you're a traitor, you're a counter-revolutionary, you're an ultra-leftist, it's the same language, it's just in different times. It's the same people. Many whistleblowers in the province of Mpumalanga, which is in the, in the northeast part of so, uh, South Africa, there have been over 20 whistleblowers who have been assassinated, taken out. What were they whistleblowing on? Amongst other things, the massive corruption around the 2010 Soccer World Cup stadiums. There was a huge massive corruption involving numerous ANC politicians. And when the speaker of the legislature, Jim Mpala, who was a personal friend of mine, was about to testify in front of a committee, he was gunned down on his front steps, two bullets in the back of his head. Nobody to this day has been convicted of that. That's one example. So similar kinds of things. But the one that is the most amazing to me is the Drugs and Drug Trafficking Act of 1982. It's still a piece of legislation in South Africa, and the ANC refuses to change it. There's a court case right now in the court system that's about to go to the Constitutional Court challenging this that act. It's a racist colonial act. Cannabis, marijuana, DACA, as we call it in South Africa, one of the largest cash crops illegal. Who's it grown by? Poor black women in the rural areas. It's the backbone of the rural economies of Kuzmina Town, Eastern Cape. If it was legalized, it would revolutionize the, the economy of South Africa. It's being opposed by the ANC on what basis? on the basis that it is morally indefensible to smoke Dacha. What is the, this is a Calvinist, old Christian, racist, colonial law that they refuse. And who are the ones that are arguing beside them in court? Doctors for Life, a right-wing Christian evangelical group of individuals arguing with the ANC against changing the law. That's where things have come to in this context. It's, the ironies are just and sometimes too, too um, incredible to even contemplate. In order to politically cover for this, the ANC presents itself, though. It's got to defend itself. It's, got to, it's basically got to say to others, no, 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 Dale, as they do, as Pravin Gordon, those of you who know our ex-minister of finance, who's been feted as the savior and the person who's the anti-corruption crusader in our country. And I challenged him in a, in a public uh, uh, um, talk the other, about three months ago at Vitz University. And he came after me and said, you're just a radical. You don't understand power, you don't understand how difficult it is to, to do these kinds of things. It's always the same answer. It's always about, you won't know, let us take care of it. So the ANC is like that. So what do they have to do? They have to de declare themselves and those that are in power as the self-declared sole representative and custodian of the will and interpreter of the people's will. We know what's better for you. It's a very patronizing uh, political uh, kind of politics. We know what's good for you and we will tell you of the nation indeed of the entire struggle for liberation. If we want to see where South Africa is going along these political lines, look at Zimbabwe. To where, if you say anything about Mugabe, you're a traitor, you are a racist, you are an imperialist, you are anything else. Do you know, here's the ultimate act, Blady Zimande, the general secretary of the Communist Party, who just got fired by Zuma <laughs> two weeks ago, his comeuppance, but about four years ago, what did he say? He wanted to pass a law that made it a crime to criticize the president. The general secretary of the Communist Party publicly came out and said, we must pass a law that says if you criticize the president, you go to jail. Yeah, that gives you an indication of where that kind of politics goes to itself. And of course, when you fuse the party, the nation, the state, and the liberation struggle, everybody else is the enemy. Everybody else gets painted with a broad brush, and so you, you frame uh, the political terrain. Uh, it's like going back, you know, it's, 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 so it's not only rich, rich white people and some new, new very rich black people that are now living in enclosed, what I call medieval, almost medieval types of estates where they're keeping the barbarians at bay. Come to South Africa, any of those, you know, you know in Johannesburg where I live, it's high wall security, barbed wire, it's keeping all the people because, you know, you've got to keep them at bay and you keep them out. There's entire cities. The largest private sector investment in the southern hemisphere is going on right now just outside of Johannesburg. It's called Stain City. It's by a capitalist called Dow Stain. 
who got in with Mandela right from the beginning, and the ANC became very close buddies with the ANC leadership. He's building a city named after himself, which is all inclusive. It's got its own schools, its own shopping center, its own transportation system, its own sanitation system, its own everything, and it's walled off. You know what's right next door? It's a place called Dietzmut, which is home to about half a million squatters and people who are in living in halls where there's open sanitation running in the street. That's South Africa. That's 23 years after. That is a representation, symbolism of what I'm talking about. Okay, there are many other points I, that, that are made in this, in this book, but to paraphrase Horace Campbell, who wrote an excellent book many years ago called The Failure of the Patriarchal Model of Liberation, and he was talking about Zimbabwe. Um, and he was arguing how the Zimbabwean liberation has been privatized in the form of Mugabe and his family. Um, my argument is simply that what has happened in South Africa is the corporatization of liberation. So it's not a family di di dynasty. It's, it's what I've talked about, these fractions. These factions, it's, it's the party has become the friend of capital. It is exercising in that service. So in the 20 so years now since the ANC has been in power, this has allowed for the generalized political and economic commodification of South African society and its development with all the attendant impacts on governance, the exercise of power, the understanding and practice of democracy, and on larger societal-wide political, economic, and social relations. I haven't even begun to mention what has been happening within the so society. So, for example, South Africa, as you would think, that on the basic fronts, at least we would have you know, some of the basics taken care of. No housing. We could go into that. We could go into the to the provision of sanitation. Now, the, if you're an ANC apologist, they'll, they'll trot out and say, but 1994, only 45% of people had access to sanitation, uh, to water. Now, 85% have sanitation. But what they don't tell you is what does access mean? So what have they done? They put in prepaid water meters. Prepaid water meters means if you're poor, you can only access the water after you pay. If you're rich, you can access as much as you want you pay afterwards. That's what the reality is. So we, we, instead of basically taking these things at face value. If we go underneath and we dig up, we'll see that this, the picture is not a very a pretty one. However, this is not all doom and gloom. It's not. Because I'm a strong believer, and I think most people are in South Africa, that you have to, as I say, you have to face things. You have to look at them in the face and see. If you have illusions, you will be disillusioned. You will be disillusioned. It's no good being disillusioned because then you become ineffective. You sit around and just complain and mope all the time about how we can't change things and how everything's too powerful and how it's just that and everything else. If you look at something and look at it for what it is, then you possibly can begin to start trying to find ways to change it. And in South Africa, the great thing is, is that a lot of people are waking up to this and have been alive to it, particularly those that have very little. They've been out there struggling every day, making demands, asking questions, struggling on a range with this community organizations and other kinds of things. And so people are not staying still. They're not remaining silent. The popular power is beginning to bubble to the surface. Yes, it is messy. But then again, popular power and democracy is always messy. It doesn't follow some neat solution uh, that everybody, that leaders can tell us. So in that case, it's the embracing of the, of the radical possibilities are there. And people are, 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 are moving forward. And let me just, to finish off, uh, right at the end, when I talk about moving beyond the ANC and this corporatized frame. Uh, without providing any, and I'm not a believer, I've been part. I've learned, I think all of us, hopefully we learn from our experiences. I've learned from being part of a vanguard. I was part of a vanguard for a long time. I believe that if it was just a bunch of committed individuals that had the answer and had the theory, we could thrust it in there and basically convince everybody else. But the problem with that is that you've already got it all worked out for everybody else. You've already got it all worked out. It's just a matter of persuading people, in, as opposed to bringing people on board and, and listening to people and what they have to say, and particularly ordinary folks who know much better oftentimes than the intellectuals and those who have the theory. So the struggle to move beyond the ANC and the corporate framework is effectively a struggle to stop believing that capitalism can be reformed to benefit everybody, that the national, the national state and nationalist politics are the primary vehicles for systemic change. I haven't even gotten into the discussion of nationalism and the narrow nationalism that have come, where you have an ANC leaders who base their moral authority on acceptance of everybody and are breaking down national borders, who are now talking about the interlopers from Zimbabwe, the other Africans who are coming and taking our jobs, just like here. Same thing, xenophobia, all those kinds of things. 
It cannot be. That the ANC itself can be saved and can be refashioned as a people's champion. I would argue that that is past. We need to move beyond that. Um, in this respect, um, the struggles that are going on are clearly not on the side of the majority, but they are incipient and they are pregnant with possibilities. So rather than having easy answers and easy solutions from those that are on top, a bottom-up approach of that objective reality is needs to embrace a willingness to rethink politics, to develop a militant sense of hope in embracing and empowering solidarity and think outside of established political orthodoxies, along with healthy doses of humility, the readiness to listen and to learn, the courage to confront as well as to act and fearlessly engage in difficult, patient, and consistently principled struggle, we can plant the seeds that will grow the self-belief in the individual and collective ability to change things, to be part of forging a bottom-up, interlinked alternative, to be part of a new revolution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dale. i hand over to you, Adam, for some comments. Okay. Uh, I want to, first of all, uh, thank Dale for his uh, wonderful presentation. I met Dale uh, earlier this year in South Africa, um, and we had a number of conversations, and uh, uh, I think you can get a sense from his presentation how much he has been involved in kind of... Uh, uh, some of the more recent struggles, and I want to come back to this, but I, I do want to encourage people to um, purchase Dale's book. It's a really uh, a superb, I think, account of the ANC uh, and what happened post-1994. Uh, it's written in a, a very engaging and, and uh, 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 interesting style, and it contains a lot of facts uh, that you just can't know, I think, if you're not there and you haven't, if you, if you don't have that kind of uh, engagement in the movement um, that Dale has. So I would really, really encourage people to pick up a copy of, of the book. So I had um, uh, four questions, if you like, uh, or four uh, things that I, I would like Dale to um, expand upon. And, and one uh, was the, or to begin with, I think some of the, the theoretical uh, uh, points that you touched around on the relationship uh, and how the ANC and also the SACP uh, uh, conceived the relationship between uh, the class struggle, uh, racial struggle, uh, and uh, the national struggle. Um, because you mentioned the two-stage approach um, and the national democratic revolution. Um, and I was wondering, given these debates that were at that moment, you know, in the earlier part, uh, very heated debates, I imagine, within the movement, um, and notions such as uh, the colonialism of a special type, um, these kinds of discussions. Uh, to Looking back at those debates now, to what degree did you think that there was a, uh, an alternative put forward, uh, or, or a real debate of a different kind of perspective? And to what degree are those debates uh, a reference point for activists today in South Africa? Um, in the sense of some of the movements you mentioned around uh, perhaps the decolonial, de de decolonizing movements and so forth. This, this, these debates about what, are, what is the relationship between race, class, uh, and the national struggle and how is it best seen. Um, the second qu question I had, uh, because reading a lot of, uh, uh, reading this book and, and looking at the, the evolution of the ANC, I was very much struck by the parallels with uh, Palestine and the Palestinian case, uh, and the PLO in particular. Uh, and I was particularly struck in, in the book you discuss, I think in one of the chapters, the kind of relationship between the, the inside and the outside uh, movements and, and the, the grassroots movements that emerged uh, in, in South Africa that were uh, outside of the purview of the ANC, and the ANC moved quite quickly to kind of subordinate them and, and um, uh, stamp their authority over them. And very, this was very, very similar to the, to the case in, in, in Palestine. Uh, and, I, and you also mention in the book uh, the SACP, and there was an interesting, there's an interesting paragraph where you talk about the SACP actually putting forward an alternative uh, strategy based upon mass action and uh, a popular uh, 
you know, uh, popular uprising and, and, and so forth, uh, counterposed to what the ANC was putting forward at the time. I think this was in 89, I think, or, or the early or the late 80s. And then very quickly, there's a convergence between the ANC and the SACP. So reading this, reading these kinds of accounts of the political dynamics, it, it I mean, the question that remains, and it's a question I have also in the, in the case of Palestine, is why? Why, did, why, did, why were they able to do this? Uh, was it just the fact that, I mean, what gave them the power? Where were the, uh, the uh, alternative uh, debates, the alternative um, uh, political polls or political positions um, that allowed this kind of hegemony of the movement to be uh, set by organizations like the ANC? And particularly in the case of the SACP. I mean, surely there must have been in the SACP uh, a, a different perspective, a, a different um, outlook that uh, was it, did they just lose the debate or, or what, what was it? Um, the other thing, two, two other short points that I would, I would love to hear you to, to, to say more about. Uh, you didn't really discuss in your talk, but you do in the book, um, the kind of shift in the nature of capitalism in South Africa post-1994, a shift away from what's being called um, the minerals energy complex um, to a much more financialized kind of capitalism uh, which relies upon you know international uh, listing on international stock markets and and these kinds of the still the same groups are there but they're, they're much more internationalized in their focus I'm wondering to, to what degree does that shift in the nature of South African capitalism uh, connect to the kind of the political trends that you've you've outlined uh, uh, how does it affect the way the ANC operates and the way that people like Zuma um, uh, uh, see themselves? Then finally, uh, picking up on the last point that you, you, you raised around uh, hope for the future and, and kind of new, new movements, I wonder if you could talk uh, specifically about uh, three movements, um, the, the, the NUMSA, uh, uh, and the, kind, the new trade union, uh, 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 or the, the split of NUMSA from Kasatu, and the, the new an attempt to build an alternative trade union federation outside of outside of Kasatu, um, and and their attempt also to make this wider than just the labour or the organised labour movement and, and build a united front, what they call the united front. So some kind of assessment of that project, I, I think, um, would be really interesting to hear. The second one is the. Um, uh, uh, the Economic Freedom Fighters, the EFF, uh, which has be seems to have become a major political uh, voice, uh, setting themselves on one hand as an opposition to the ANC, but on the other hand um, working with the, the DA and other parties to the right and, and seeming to have um, some very problematic parts of their politics as well. So again, if you could give us an assessment of, of, of the EFF from your perspective. Then finally, um, the Fees Must Fall movement, uh, the, the student movement uh, that emerged in different forms, I think, uh, uh, in the most recent period. Uh, do you see uh, that movement as, as offering some kind of potential for um, for uh, a new political opposition to emerge. So both your assessment of these kinds of uh, political oppositions, but also how they potentially may or may not work together. Is, is there a potential for them to actually come together? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Al, shall we give you a few minutes to respond to those and then open out to the floor? Yes, and let me preface this by saying my, my responses are gonna be inadequate because there's no way that I can respond to all of those questions, Adam, in a, in a, a really comprehensive way. I'll try my best. Uh, they're very good questions and, and, and require, I think, in-depth answers. Um, in, in a short period of time, I'll try to, to highlight some of the key points, I think. Let me start at the, at the, the last, and then we'll move forward to the, the first ones. Um, what do I think of the fees, uh, the fees must fall? First of all, it's, it's, it's great that this has happened. I think it's, it's many of us, um, when I started, when we started and founded the, co the anti-privatization forum, uh, it was students, it was union members, and it was community organizations coming together to oppose privatization and outsourcing and corporatization. Corporatization of the university, of the city, and of basic services. Um, and since then, that was in the early 2000s, mid-2000s, there's been a real quiescence in the student uh, movement up until recently. So it's really good to see the students mobilizing themselves being becoming much more political and raising. The fundamental challenge of the student movement 
um, reflects the fundamental challenges of South Africa, which are fundamentally that uh, they need to break out of the, the silos that oftentimes civil society or whatever we call it, non-state actors find themselves in. So where the weaknesses of the fees must fall is they have, in many cases, failed to relate to community organizations, to the poor, to the working class, beyond their own demands on campus. And as a result, many of the community organizations have seen it as a somewhat elitist struggle that is going on at universities. Um, that is that is contested at the university and the fees must fall level and I think um, that it is not an inevitability as we've begun to see just this week where the students have, have come back now again. And I think that they need to go beyond the fees must fall. Um, they've raised a range of questions but for example to go to the heart of, of some of the, which is about the budget, about power, about the way in which uh, money is being spent. So when, and, and talking to the extent of how can you, for example, uh, fund free higher education at the same time as you can fund free primary education. Because the reality is in South Africa is that even though in, in legislative terms primary education is supposed to be free, most of the decent schools are fee paying schools. So it's backdoor, what I call backdoor privatization. The students haven't addressed these kinds of issues. So I think that it's incipient, it's good, it's positive, and just like the students, if they relate and they pull, they, they, they basically begin to relate outside, then you can get past having been, and for those of you who are students and having been a student active myself, the biggest limitation of students' politics is its ephemeral nature. It's, you're only a student for three or four years and then you move and then there's another one and then there's, and so it oftentimes it's cyclical. And the way to go beyond that and for students to become a real societal force is to reach out. And I think that's the main challenge, but it's very, uh, there's a lot of possibilities there. The EFF, um, I don't think a great deal of the EFF personally because I know all the EFF leaders personally. Um, and, uh, and I know, I can tell you right now without, uh, there are some good people in the EFF who I think do, uh, who have joined the EFF for, out of frustration and understanding and they speak a radical rhetoric, but to me the EFF represents the sort of, um, in some ways, the, uh, the sort of youthful version of what the ANC used to represent, which is talk left, walk right. Um, in other words, saying all the right things to the people, organized saying we must, and, but a, a very myopic understanding of what transformation means. So instead of basically saying, yes, we still have colonization, we must have economic freedom, but their answer is nationalize everything. And they don't, they, and so if you look at the manifesto of, of the EFF, basically, you know, we nationalize the mines, nationalize the land, nationalize everything, but they don't address the nature of the state in any meaningful way. So it becomes privatization of another sort, a new state bureaucracy, a new state capitalist class. And when Julius Malema, it's hard to take Julius Malema seriously, uh, when he was wearing a half a million rand watch and building a 25 million rand home uh, at the same time when he was talking about the poor and the working class. And Floyd Shavambu, who's his deputy and who I taught in a master's seminar at Wits University, walked into my class on the first day and I calculated that what he was wearing cost about, I don't know, about 200,000 rand. He was wearing Breitling watches, he was wearing, uh, and so if, if you're going to walk the talk, walk it. If you're going to beat people, to t if you want poor and working class people to take you seriously, uh, then you need to do so. And unfortunately right now, the FF, I don't think, is doing that. So they are, I think they're going to get, their support will get saturated. Uh, they'll come up to maybe, they got 6% in the last uh, uh, national elections. They may go 8, 7, 8, 9, 10% possibly. They'll become a significant minority player. But I don't think they can move beyond that because they fundamentally don't have, I don't think, a relationship with, with where the mass really is. Um, that's my own personal experience and opinion. NUMSA, um, it's hugely, one of those hugely disappointing uh, 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 things where the, the possibilities were mass. I wrote about that many of us who have been involved had a lot of hopes for NUMSA and the new federation uh, and its united front, precisely because what was being said was we're going to build a united front of forces that include people from everywhere from poor communities, women's groups, youth groups, civic groups, and including the unions. Get beyond the union, get beyond the bureaucracy of the unions, and actually build a political force. Unfortunately, NUMSA then basically, in doing so, forgot the very basis of the United Front and essentially tried to tell everybody what they were going to do, which was, we're going to build a movement for socialism that is going to be a vanguard of the working class, which is going to replace the SACP, which has betrayed us. And Erwin Jim wants to be the new general secretary of the SACP.
of a new refashioned Communist Party, unfortunately. And I, I've known Erwin since he was a, a shop steward uh, in, in, in NUMSA. And again, speaking very well, but the practice of these things, and NUMSA is divided. It's becoming very divided amongst itself. Some of the most radical elements of NUMSA have already been purged. There are allegations that NUMSA itself has been captured by other private interests and that NUMSA's investment company is wholly compromised by investments in the very kinds of people that they're supposedly opposing as a movement for socialism. So there's a whole range of contradictions that unfortunately have made the United Front fairly stillborn. The United Front does not really exist in any meaningful way in South Africa right now as far as the NUMSA uh, front is concerned. The new federation, I think, has some possibilities because it's wider than that. It's, NUMSA is the, the largest union, but um, I'm afraid that fundamentally the unions have in South Africa still have not gotten out of the, the old way of doing things, which is still to believe that the way in which you build alternatives is through a working class which has fundamentally changed in the last 25 years. And so they're going to unionized workers, employed workers. That's a, fun, that's a small minority of the working class in South Africa. The real working class is unemployed, casualized labor, contract labor. And they're not speaking to them. And they say they're going to speak to them, but they haven't really done much. But it's early days, so I think SAFTU should be given the, the SAFTU, which is the South African Federation of Trade Unions, which is the new, should be given the benefit of the doubt and see where it goes. It has, there's possibilities there, but unless they break out of that old union model, of doing things, and also their gender politics, which I haven't even talked about, which is, tends to be a very patriarchal politics in the unions, a very male-dominated patriarchal politics that is not speaking to women workers and not speaking to women who reproduce labor constantly. In other words, domestic workers, others who, it's like they're not real workers. You have to be an industrial worker, you know, industrial worker. This old line of the industrial worker is still, and yet the industrial worker is not at the forefront of the struggles at the moment that are taking place on the ground in many cases. They're simply trying to protect their job. Um, so there's a lot of challenges there. Shift in the nature of capitalism, financialization, to what degree does this connect to the ANC's politics in Tezuma? I think that where it connects fundamentally is that um, it's, uh, uh, and this is, is, is presented in South Africa as a sort of like anti-imperialism. You know, we're getting away from the West and BRICS and we're moving towards China, you know, the, the developing countries and everything. To me, it's basically just a shift. It's like it's called the shift in the balcony chairs on the capitalist deck, basically. So the financialization does explain quite a lot because it's financialization in, in, of different fractions of capital from different places. So the old, it might seem as though there's some, from, some fundamental changes in that, in that context, but it's not really the case, I would argue. And it's the Chinese, for example, have come in very big. The Russians, of course, as you know, uh, want to come in with the um, nuclear deal. But in terms of, uh, of um, the, the old white, predominantly white capital and financialization, what it represents is new forms of cu accumulation for the new black bureaucratic and political elite. I made an argument that this is exactly why South Africa never sided with the people of Zimbabwe against Mugabe. Why has South Africa for 20 years supported Mugabe? Why? Was it because there was old liberation, as many analysts have argued, there was old liberation context? No. If anybody knows any, anything about the history of Zimbabwe, they know that the ANC had close relations with Zipra and Z Zapu, not with ZANU. ZANU was Chinese. Zani so went with the other direction. So there was never, the ANC was never close to Mugabe. In fact, they were on opposite sides. But now, why are they, why are they um, supporting him? My argument is because of the economic uh, avenues it opens up. Uh, the, as the Zimbabwean economy implodes, it provides new avenues of accumulation for South Africa, particularly mining and extractive capital, as does the DRC, as does Zambia. So the financialization also begins to provide the necessary capital in order to create what I call a sub-imperialist role for South Africa, and Zuma and them have got their piece of the pie in that. So it does, there's a certain explanation there. Um, Inside-outside movement, what was, why did the, um, the hegemony of the ANC, why did the ANC win out? Why were there these, all these other alternatives? Um, I would argue that the reason why it, it didn't is because one of two things, the ANC had unparalleled moral authority. We cannot underestimate the impact of Mandela. Um, Mandela, and I, I can say this again from personal experience, in the early 1990s when all the negotiations were going on, I was a member of the ANC Yeovil branch, and anybody in Joburg know Yeovil branch, Ronnie Casseroles, all these other heavyweight ANC people were all members of the same branch, Joe Slobo, others, SACP types, and um, 
When Mandela walked into a room and he came there, everybody kept quiet. It was like going back to the old chief. The chief speaks, nobody says anything. You can't criticize Mandela. You can't say anything bad about Mandela. Mandela puts his, 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 um, his stamp of approval on something. If you do, it's political suicide. You go against him. So it was the same. In the 1980s, anybody will tell you who was a member of ZAPO, the Beast Berklak Consciousness Movement, the ANC members attacked other liberation movement people who were against the ANC. Because if you were against Mandela, you were against liberation. You were against the people. And in that case, what I'm trying to say is the hegemony of the ANC was the ANC's ability through Mandela to capture the majority of people to believe that that was the right, that, that there was no other alternative other than the ANC. So even if, the SA, if there were people in the SACP that said, we want to get back to a mass oriented or we want to go outside, it was no. This is the way. Mandela and the, and the comrades here, they've sacrificed everything. They've told us that this is the way. This is what we must follow. Their loyalty goes very, very deep. There's no other explanation for why people, 23 years later, still vote for the ANC or still, um, uh, some people still uh, support the ANC in the face of all evidence, empirical evidence to the contrary, that it's, it's, like, it's like the Trump phenomenon. White working class people who are getting screwed by Trump vote for Trump. Um, and you, you can't explain that simply by, um, sorry, yeah, you can't explain that simply by um, looking at, at uh, the, the bigger picture. I think it has to go to that loyalty. Finally, the class, racial, national, CST, the theory, or what degree uh, of relevance does it have today? It has a lot of relevance today, but my fundamental uh, answer to that is it's, it's basically the, the class, racial, and national component is a very shallow understanding at the moment. It goes only to the extent of identity politics. It doesn't go to the structural politics of each of those things. So our debate is not happening at a structural level, and therefore the theory can't be applied in its, in its real relevance, which is essentially that if you want to uproot that foundation, we need to go down and we need to talk about how we go to those foundations. It's not about how many people uh, quotas. It's not about racial quotas. It's not about how many, C, like the ANC says, transformation is how many black CEOs do we have in the private sector? No, that's not transformation. That's, again, shifting of the capitalist chairs. So the, 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 the theory remains irrelevant, but only to the extent that it can go down to a structural level. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, excellent. Well, thank you. And uh, let's open up to the floor at this point. If you want to put your hand up, if you want to ask a question, then we can circulate the mics. Yep. And then there, and then there. Um, thank you for that. Oh, sorry. <coughs> oh, yeah. um, you touched on the ANC being talking about um, non-racialism as their primary goal um, initially, and that was the narrative that they were perpetuating. Um, uh, and you spoke particularly about uh, the racial politics and the identity politics in South Africa. Um, then you also touched on uh, being a white person and, ha and having dissenting views um, when bringing up kind of issues that are going on in South Africa. Um, and the House and the apartheid House of South Africans or the ANC just moving into the House. Um, and then because I'm a South African, as you can probably tell, um, the Rose Must Fall movement, which morphed into the Peace Must Fall movement. Um, Rose Must Fall initially started out of some racial politics that were happening at GCT and Cape Town and South Africa at large about whiteness and what it means and white culture and what that means and the perpetuation of, of whiteness in, 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 in universities, which morphed into a capitalist idea and fees must fall and the corporatization and privatization of education. Um, but you were, you, were, you were silent about the role of like those histories, right? About the house and, and, and kind of, I think you were kind of neglecting the ideas on white monopoly capital and, and, and centralizing the ANC as, as having inherited this and retaining that, which we don't deny. I think particularly as students, we are very clear on the ANC and its role in retaining that. But also I think there was a silence about race and still its issues that are in South Africa. Um, can you just touch on that? Sure. Um, for instance, with the Fees Must Fall movement at WITS last year, um, 
when students and workers decided to down tools, there were still white students at WITS who were like, no, we need to go back to school because our capital is being compromised. So we talk about a non-racial South Africa and a non-racial building that the, 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 the ANC was talking about in 94, but still the silence around the racial tensions that exist and the white students still not wanting to participate. So at which point do we intersect those ideas on identity politics and structures when we have people who are still retaining those ideas but still retaining the voice of the ANC as the sole um, bearers of the South African burden? Okay, great, thank you. And there was a question over here. If you want to keep your questions, comments as, as succinct as you can so we can be a bit more, you know, bring as many people in as possible. Sure. I'll try to be very brief. Um, I think I'm more interested first on the analogy that you used of a house, on what would be, according to the analysis that you gave of how the ANC has failed to transform the economy from 1990, what would be your your strategies that could have been taken at the time. When Mandela goes out of prison, he says two things. He says, firstly, we had to reconcile ourselves with two possibilities. He said, number one was we go into straight civil war to fight for our economy and our country, in which case the country will be streamed by bloods for many generations to come. And secondly, he says, we go into negotiations, which means we compromise and we start a process of building a new society. And based on that, I believe that it was, uh, it was more on, they believe that through political power, because Mandela's vision was one man, one vote, through, to, through political power, they'll be able to shape, to shape and change the economic landscape. And then secondly, I'm more interested in um, the electoral systems than the role that they have in deepening our democracy. The proportional representation system that was used in 1990 was critical and very important in transcending from an apartheid regime into a constitutional democracy. Now we've been 23 years into democracy and we have a lot of problems. We see the mass killings in um, Guazulu Natal, state looting. How can we reimagine our politics? in as far as the electoral systems are concerned. Okay, thank you. There was a hand behind you, so if you just pass it back and then okay. we'll, do, we'll let Dale answer and do more questions, don't worry. Um, just also to say, autobiographically, I was an anti-apartheid activist here in Britain, so I'm not from South Africa, but I've followed the struggle for about 40 or so years. And I do think, uh, like, I like the book very much, um, and I like the analogy of foundation, but I think there's something missing in your analysis of what the foundation is, which is this colonial aspect. I mean, white monopoly capital has been distorted into an empty phrase, but actually it's a living reality still, in terms of the privilege of white people in South Africa, in terms of the importance of the struggle against the heritage of roads, both symbolically and in reality. I mean, white monopoly capital is related also to us here in Britain. So, I mean, that's the angle that I'm coming in from. If you look at the economy, if you look at mining, look at Longman, look at Anglo-American, etc. I mean, so the, your politics are, I'm very sympathetic to, but I mean, the political economy and the structural point which you end on also should inform the politics. I mean, the race question is not over in South Africa, as far as I can see, right? It's a neo-colony. I mean. I mean, your analysis sort of focuses on the neoliberal aspect, but what about the neo-colonial aspect of it? Okay, thanks. Yeah, one of the frustrations, obviously, of giving a talk where you're allowed 15 minutes is you can't cover all of these things um, in, in the context and, and leaving some of this out. I want to actually, I, I want to get to the, the point of two of the questions because um, this notion that, as I said from the beginning, I don't believe, of course, I said very clearly that race and class are still very, very much intertwined in, in the South African re reality, and I don't think one can understand the one from the other. Where I think the weakness of the present debate is it falsely separates one from the other. Either one, either you get everything just simply talking about class, or you're simply talking about race. As if, ra as if you can deal with the racial fund without dealing with foundational issues of, for example, ownership, that have racialized patterns to them, but also have particular class patterns to them. 
So, as Zimb and, and as I've, I've, I've debated with many of the students at WITS and others, I said, you know, and, and many of Zimbabwean students will tell you that, you know, what, when they began to learn the, the intersection of race and class, which was, you know, that, that it wasn't simply about returning the land to the people, everything, it was about who owns the land. Yeah? So if you have one capitalist who replaces another capitalist who owns that land, right, and they just have a different skin color, but they they exactly the same kind of system, well then the racial aspect of it still remains, but it takes on a different kind of class basis. Let me give you my analysis of the continuities of power and colonization, decolonization. I'm just going to take a little extract from my book because I think it says it much better than I can extemporaneously. Um, is that the generalized triumph of the colonial lineage, lineage of not just the ANC, but I would argue all national liberation movements, has produced a situation in which all those national liberations have become the main vehicles for exercising a refashioned political power that reproduces the economic and social power of the colonial past. Rather than acting as a political vehicle for transforming and then transcending that colonial power, they've instead politically legitimized and reinforced it. Given that those national ex in those liberation movements, including the ANC, access power in a continental and global context of highly unequal power relations with corporate capital, this, what this has done is that these acts of political legitimization of the colonial past have legitimized the acceptance of a second-class rentier status for South Africa, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Angola. Such status is encompasses, and here's the crucial point I want to make, the social, psychological, and cultural realms as well as the economic realm. What do I mean by that? So here's the, the, the issue. Barring from Ashish Nandi, for those of you who might know, the Indian political psychologist and sociologist, the acceptance of the colonial status of you know, the, the, this, this notion of, of under being, being under colonial um, identities and other things is directly derived, as he quotes, a colonialism which survives the demise of empires, which enables the psychological and social hierarchies that enable the West to harness its own productive capacities to be reimposed on the colony this time entirely in the service of domination and denial. So when those hierarchies become superimposed onto the political rule of the new post-colonial state, post-colonial state, right, the ANC's role as the new political landlords therefore becomes symbiotically tied to the acceptance and inculcation of the role of the old colonial economic landlords. They become one and the same thing is what happens, whose baggage is also loaded with all those psychological and social hierarchies. So put another way, the corporatization of power frames and catalyzes the parallel corporatization of the mind and body. This is so because the essence of corporatization is to be found in the essence of colonialism. What is that? An oligarchy, in this case a, racial, a racialized, a class oligarchy in which power is understood and exercised according to a hierarchy of socioeconomic position and racialized location, inclusive of class, race, gender, and sexuality. And if we Isolate one from the other, we cannot decolonize. So you can say we're going to decolonize according to race. Yeah? But then LGBTI people have no point, they have no basis in this because we have an African nationalism that doesn't accept the new sexual identities, which is a problem with Vitz University, in which LGBTIQ students were pushed aside by those who were arguing for a much more militant racial identification of a nationalist politics and a decolonization. Or one can then look at these in many different ways. So what I'm trying to argue here is, is the struggle to decolonize does not simply have to do with the deracialization and overcoming the historically oppressive role of constructed racial identities, division and inequality. It has to do with that too. But also it has to do just as much with the conceptualization, conscientization and practice of power that is realized through economic, racial, ethnic, religious, coercive, institutional, political, sexual or gendered roles. If we separate one out of the other, what we get is KZN. We get a KZN where the ANC and, and those who claim that they're trying to deracialize and decolonize blame Indians for being a, the, 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 the oppressive force and therefore re-ethnicize the politics or whether they claim that other people are doing a certain thing. So that's the point I'm trying to make. I'm not trying to, to, to delegitimize the racial component or leave it out. I'm trying to say that the foundation is multifaceted and what the ANC has failed to do, and I think what the Fees Must Fall uh, comrades are beginning to, to try to, to do, is to, to understand colonization in its panoply, in its full panoply. The colonization wasn't simply about just racial domination. It was about 
gender domination. It was about high, it was about sexual domination. It was about a whole range of kinds of domination that have been reimposed on a new political order. So in that context, I hope maybe in, in some ways I've addressed that issue. And whiteness in that context is a very real thing, right? But then so too is you know, the issue of white monopoly capital, for example. This is the, this is the issue. White monopoly capital, and let's take South African breweries as an example. Let's take South African breweries. One of the most successful white monopoly capitalist forms in South Africa. The financialization of SAB meant that as soon as as the, 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 the neoliberal uh, uh, recipe was adopted, i.e. tariff regulations and exchange controls and in the early 1990s, mid-1990s were lessened, what did South African breweries do? It went on a buying spree internationally. It bought up the second largest brewer in the United States, Miller Beer. So it became SAB Miller. It bought up Czech breweries, Chinese breweries, everything else. It became the second largest brewer in their world. It was no longer white monopoly capital, it was Chinese capital, it was American capital, it was all sorts of other capital. In fact, it was, in, in some cases, um, uh, African capital itself as well was, was part of S.A. Brewers. Now S.A. Brewers is bought out by Anheuser-Busch, the largest brewer in the world. So, and it still dominates the Joburg Stock Exchange. So you can't, when you say white monopoly capital, yes, its origins were there, but in order to deal with the capital and to, re, to use that capital for the people's purposes, you have to go beyond simply the question of race. You can't just look at that and say it's white monopoly capital. It has become multinational capital. It has become global capital. It has become a whole range of other kinds of capital, the different fractions of capital. And if we only isolate one fraction of the capital, we're only going to be dealing with one part of the problem. That was my argument in this case. Um, so I hope that that, I know that that is, doesn't get us, this debate could, and, and engagement could go on for quite some time, and it should, and, 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 it, and it's, it's in a very important one. Uh, but I, what I find sometimes very, very frustrating, and this is again in the um, having been with, in, involved right from the beginning with some of the VIT students and Fees Must Fall and everything else, is when those students refused to go to class. It wasn't just white students. There were a large amount of black students who refused, who, who, who wanted to go back to class as well. It wasn't just a racial issue. It was a class issue as well. There were many black students who said, having interviewed many of them myself for a project, who said, at UCT in particular, they said, yes, we agree with all of these things, but we come from an, a, a situation where if we miss class for another two months, we're going to have be massive debts. Our parents are going to have to pull us out of university, and we're not going to be able to complete our university situation. And ironically, it was the wealthier kids and the middle and upper middle class kids who could sit out of class for much longer than the poor. So it's become an, it's not just a racial issue, it's also a class issue. Okay, great. Uh, there was a question here. Yep. Hello. Okay, it's on. Um, so the other day I sat with my grandpa, who is a very staunch ANC um, activist man. And he, and he was talking to me about how the ANC is going to make major changes now because there's radical economic transformation. And I sat with him and I was like, Nkulu, what's radical economic transformation? And he was like, yeah, you know, that thing that the ANC says. And it was, um, and it was, and I mean, for me, that was a huge turning point, and it's one of the reasons, which is why I'd like to do my thesis in terms of looking at what is radical economic transformation for South Africa, and will that change anything? And at least, I mean, in my own politics and how I align and don't align, it's very obvious that, and I think this is something that Robinson proves in his book of why nations fail, that the institutions that are, that are still kept in place will mean that even if we've got great economic policies that are really great in theory, the practical implementation of them won't amount to anything. And the ANC is talking about, well, this concept of radical economic transformation of deracializing the economy, but I think my concerns are that it's, a, it's now become a populist word to a lot of poor people. And, and it's one that they'll continue to use, especially now as the elections are coming. And the sad thing is that, and I asked my grandpa, I said to him, do you really think things will change if now we have a racialized economy and the ANC is still able to retain so much money and so much power at the expense of poor people? And then you expect that a new economic policy will empower poor people, but surely our government is still a very extractive one. So does their nature change? I think my question to you is, what is your understanding of radical economic transformation? And will that result in any change, especially for the poorest in South Africa, considering that in the last two years, um, 
poverty has increased by 3 million people. Um, so my question, as much as it's in relation to students, just to speak about how the Roads Must Fall movement, I feel like captured both the colonization side and then the Fees Must Fall movement looked at the economic side. And I am not an ANC member, like I'll criticize ANC um, to the greatest extent. But I think the reason why I can support someone like the EFF um, is is in the sense, yes, the issue of land is important, you know, um, in, in, in all its assets, because land can mean um, dignity, it can mean power, it can mean money, so many things. But fundamentally, what I think the EFF has done in the last five years is this idea that we completely reject the way this, this term South Africa and New South Africa has not been experienced. I think um, if I were to go back and be sitting at the negotiation table, I would definitely would have resorted to a revolution. I don't. I think the the problem now is that we we never had one. We have 23 years of you know we have one of the highest inequalities in the world, um, and it's because we do this thing where, to some degree, I feel like Dale, you you've done is that you you've captured an element of the problem, criticizing the ANC, criticizing how the ANC has become a neoliberal party in the sense that they, they leave out the majority, which is the poor. But, but I could never blame, I find it difficult to blame a system on, an, an, I find it difficult to blame the ANC in the sense that I'm thinking of just the systemic power of just white supremacy in the entire world. Like I think, I think if South Africa were to try again or start again, we must completely eradicate everything and start from the bottom. And the reason why, you know, white people in South Africa can say things like, no, Zuma must fall, the ANC must fall, is because it, it becomes a very personal thing when your house in Camps Bay or your house in Clifton is affected by um, by the ANC, but the moment a black person criticizes the ANC and, and, and or, or, or let's say supports a party like the EFF, the idea is that we're too radical or we're too revolutionary and we, we, we don't want to, we want South Africa to fail. But what is the, what, there's no meaning for me if the economy does not serve the majority. If the economy, it means nothing for me if the economy is going to change for a certain few, but for majority it's it means nothing. Okay, great. One here. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, my question is very linked to the democratic and economic reconstruction. So, the, so you talked about. Um, when I hear you, I, I feel that you have a real anarchist perspective of the state and the power, and not a very communist or Trotskyist one. Um, so, my question is, uh, how do people? Uh, can you elaborate on how people organize uh, at a real? bottom level uh, and is there a difference between um, black organization for example or white organization um, on the ground and okay great another one there i'm going to sure. do a couple more just because we've got finishing okay. time and then i'll just give you one okay. more round of... hi thank you um i think my, my question is sort of similar to what you say because you you talked about this i mean you painted it in a very gloomy way but then you, you did say then there is hope, but then you also alluded to the fact that there's this like stranglehold or chokehold that the ANC possesses. It has this moral authority, it has, um, it has reproduced its power. So then how do you build unity? I mean, there has been episodic moments where there has been public manifestations of anger towards the ANC, but it has sure. largely amounted to nothing and it still amounts to nothing. Like generally the ANC still has that big, authority, morally or legitimately, I mean, it, it has a lot of history to that. So how do you, because I think it's sort of like similar, like thinking about supporting a different party that's not the ANC is still very difficult for people who are not white generally. So then how do you build that sort of unity that will be sustainable to be able to like, I don't know, a revolution is not really like the right word, but like get South Africa that everybody thinks we should have got in 1994, 
versus what we're currently seeing, which is just like a, a substitution. Thank you. Just, just very quickly also to follow up on the previous questions on the alternative. Considering the situation in 1944, uh, uh, um, the role of the United States were very significant and their concerns um, for the future of South Africa was, uh, was huge. Um, and they send a lot of people to South Africa to work with the ANA, in ANC and to infiltrate and to manipulate and so on. And they were probably also um, ready to go into a large-scale destabilization of South, um, um, South Africa. Um, what would the alternative have been for if you were in that situation uh, of the ANC uh, at the time when they had to make these decisions on how to move forward? Thank you. All right, there, there's, a, there's a common theme, which, and, and I apologize in the initial in, um, answer that I didn't address that, so now we're coming back to it in terms of the, the negotiations and what was the alternative. Um, because, and, and I'm going to, I was just meeting this afternoon with Pluto Press, which published, I deal with this in the first book in, in, at length, because the first book is about the ANC and the liberation struggle from 1912 to 94, for the, the entire time. And it talks about what, the, what was possible in the late 80s and, and early 90s. Here's, here's, here's what was possible. What was possible was actually locating the politics with where the people were. In other words, where was the locus of power that fundamentally shifted the balance of forces, of forces in the 1980s? It was with people's organizations. It was with the UDF, with students, with uh, people on the ground. It wasn't, yes, the banks, you know, called in some of the loans, there was financial pressures, there was economic, but that was a result of some of the anti-apartheid movement and so forth and so on. But it wasn't because of their armed struggle. Every MK cater, including Chris Hani, who I uh, was, when I joined the SACP, I joined because of Chris. Um, and Chris Hani, who was the commander of MK, will tell you that there was no way that MK was ever going to militarily overthrow the apartheid state. There was no way that they could ever take them on militarily and march into Pretoria with military triumph. It was a sabotage campaign. It was trying to basically encourage people and show that there was, there was uh, you know, armed sabotage, armed struggle in that context. So the locus of power was with people. It wasn't with Oliver Tambo and Thabo Mbeki sitting in Lusaka and, and people that were there. So when the negotiation started, and yes, there was no, in other words, there was no, when you talk about revolution, it wasn't going to be an armed revolution where people were going to uh, march into Pretoria. But there could have been armed insurrection. What was necessary for armed insurrection was, as the SACP at one point, including Mzala, if you read Mzala, Mzala was a young intellectual in the Communist Party in the 1970s and 80s who wrote a lot of good stuff that was ignored by the leadership. And what he basically says, if we want to succeed in creating a revolutionary situation, we've got to combine MK with people's units on the ground, underground with armed struggle. We've got to arm people and on the ground and we basically make them there. And that would never happen. Operation Vula began to start addressing it in 1989 when they started sending underground operatives to try to start arming. But fundamentally, the idea was MK will come and save us. Mandela will come and save us. The ANC will come and save us. And as a result, when negotiations started, where did the locus of power shift? To the leadership. The leadership then cut deals completely above the heads of the people. I can tell you again, because we were in the ANC, we were asking questions within the ANC branches. What is going on in the negotiations? We understand, we, we, we've heard that you're basically agreeing to issues about land ownership and, and, and putting in the Constitution sanctity of private property. Is that true? Comrades, this is, this is not something we need to discuss. This is something that is negotiations. And in other words, the alternative was to locate things with the people themselves so that people can inform, the organizations that drove the struggle can inform, not experts, not the leadership, not Joe Slovo coming with the first post-apartheid housing policy. Why we got a housing crisis in South Africa? It wasn't inevitable. It was because the very first housing policy, which was made by Joe in his study, on his own pieces of paper when he wrote, was to bring the banks in to basically fund the RDP housing policy. Nobody had any discussion. There was no debate. There was no impop, in popular input. So just like the students today are making demands that you democratize the university, the demand was democratize the negotiations, democratize the struggle. That was where the alternative was without having all the neat solutions that were going to be there coming from the experts or the people who knew. 
That's what I'm talking about popular participatory democracy, which is the, 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 the um, how should we say, the thread that runs through this whole story, which was if you want a real revolution, right? It's not about storming the Bastille with a few trained comrades. It's about organizing and mobilizing people themselves to take that power in the way that they see, not in the way that the party sees. Why is it that communist parties, you say anarchism, it's not, I don't, I don't believe in labels, anarchist, socialist, whatever it is. The point is the people themselves have to be at the heart of everything. If it's the party that's the heart of everything, why are we then surprised that every party that has called itself communist reproduces the same oppressions? Why is it that, we, if it's called it a socialist party, why is it that, you know, that they introduce, because if inevitably if that party leaves the people behind, they will then relate to that power as it is. They will relate to the, that, that class power in the, in, the, in the sense that I was talking about earlier. So the alternative is not something that is written down on a piece of paper. This is what I'm trying to argue about. We, the left has been, in my estimation, very myopic. And one of the reasons why a lot of left and progressive forces today are being left behind and people, we don't have mass left parties and mass progressive movements much anymore is because the left is not speaking to the people itself. It speaks amongst itself. And it comes up with manifestos and programs and says, comrades, here's the manifesto. Come, here's our paper. Here, believe in this. Join our party. You join our party, we'll get power. We'll change the world. That's the opposite. That's a top-down approach as opposed to a bottom-up bottom approach. So revolution is about centering the people. That's what it's about for me. It's not about an event. It's not about a process. It's not about a manifesto. And it's not about a party. And I think that if one reads Marx and one reads the fundamental philosophical foundations of communism, communism is not the Soviet Union in the context of Stalin and, and, and a vanguard party. Read the economic and philosophical manuscripts of Marx, which is the very first thing he wrote as a 20-something year old. And you get the heart of what I would argue Marxism and communism is about, which is putting the people first, not the party, not the vanguard, not the program. And then you go from there. It is intellectually unsatisfying to a lot of people because you want the answer. You've got it here in front of you, we can read it, we've got the theory, we can just apply it. But if there's any lesson of history in South Africa is that if we do that, we will continue to repeat the same mistakes. I'm just about there. What is radical economic transformation? What is it? Will it change anything? Yes, if it's taken seriously in, in, what, it, in, in what it's supposed to mean, but not in the form that it's taking now in terms of, because what basically radical economic transformation means is shifting the deck chairs. In other words, white capital, give it to black capital. So white capital becomes black capital. What does black capital do? Black capital will become black capital, but it'll just do exactly the same thing. It'll oppress workers. It'll do exactly. Racial solidarity goes out the window when profit comes to the, comes to the party. Racial solidarity goes, ask the rest of the African continent in the last 40 years what's happened to racial solidarity when black people took control of all and nationalized the industries and everything else and took control of these things. It wasn't, racial solidarity gets shifted. It's a worker-boss relationship in that context. So radical economic transformation can be radical in the sense if ownership is driven. So what did it mean by land ownership? Not about nationalization of the land. It's about, for example, that community taking control of that land and then the state providing necessary inputs and support for people to begin to own the land and produce on that land for their, their own needs, not for some state-controlled entity to say, we're taking the land on the basis of everybody else, and by the way, we're going to tell you what you can grow, when you can grow it, and how much you need to grow. Otherwise, we're going to reproduce exactly the, 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 the problems of, of centralized planning, which again is a top-down approach and leaves the people out of the equation. Yeah. Okay, excellent. I, I know there was a lot more to discuss there, so we'd like to invite you all to join us for a, um, some drinks and some food in the senior common room upstairs. Please feel free to join us and continue the discussion. The next seminar in the series uh, will be on the 14th of November, where Sarah Farris from Goldsmiths University will talk about Islamophobia in the name of women's rights, which is her new book. And I'd like to ask you all to join me in thanking our speaker and discussant for their very interesting discussion.